Chapter Twenty One, Part Five of *The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire*, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. *The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire*, Volume Two, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Twenty One, Persecution of Heresy, State of the Church, Part Five. But the injustice of these ecclesiastical judges had not been countenanced by the submission or even by the presence of Athanasius. He resolved to make a bold and dangerous experiment, whether the throne was inaccessible to the voice of truth, and before the final sentence could be pronounced at Tyre, the intrepid primate threw himself into a bark which was ready to hoist sail for the imperial city. The request of a formal audience might have been opposed or eluded, but Athanasius concealed his arrival. Watched the moment of Constantine's return from an adjacent villa, and boldly encountered his angry sovereign as he passed on horseback through the principal street of Constantinople. So strange an apparition excited his surprise and indignation, and the guards were ordered to remove the importunate suitor. But his resentment was subdued by involuntary respect, and the haughty spirit of the emperor was awed by the courage and eloquence of a bishop who implored his justice and awakened his conscience. Constantine listened to the complaints of Athanasius with impartial and even gracious attention. The members of the Synod of Tyre were summoned to justify their proceedings, and the arts of the Eusebian faction would have been confounded if they had not aggravated the guilt of the primate by the dexterous supposition of an unpardonable offence, a criminal design to intercept and detain the corn fleet of Alexandria, which supplied the subsistence of the new capital. The emperor was satisfied that the peace of Egypt would be secured by the absence of a popular leader, but he refused to fill the vacancy of the archiepiscopal throne, and the sentence, which after long hesitation he pronounced, was that of a jealous ostracism, rather than of an ignominious exile. In the remote province of Gaul, but in the hospitable court of Trebes, Athanasius passed about twenty-eight months. The death of the emperor changed the face of the public affairs, and amidst the general indulgence of a young reign, the primate was restored to his country by an honorable edict of the younger Constantine, who expressed a deep sense of the innocence and merit of his venerable guest. The death of that prince exposed Athanasius to a second persecution, and the feeble Constantius, the sovereign of the East, soon became the secret accomplice of the Eusebians. Ninety bishops of that sect or faction assembled at Antioch. Under the specious pretense of dedicating the cathedral, they composed an ambiguous creed, which is faintly tinged with the colors of semiarianism, and twenty-five canons, which still regulate the discipline of the orthodox Greeks. It was decided, with some appearance of equity, that a bishop deprived by a synod should not resume his episcopal functions till he had been absolved by the judgment of an equal synod. The law was immediately applied to the case of Athanasius. The Council of Antioch pronounced, or rather confirmed, his degradation. A stranger named Gregory was seated on his throne, and Philagrius, the prefect of Egypt, was instructed to support the new primate with the civil and military powers of the province. Oppressed by the conspiracy of the Asiatic prelates, Athanasius withdrew from Alexandria and passed three years as an exile and a suppliant on the holy threshold of the Vatican. By the assiduous study of the Latin language, he soon qualified himself to negotiate with the Western clergy. His decent flattery swayed and directed the haughty Julius. The Roman pontiff was persuaded to consider his appeal as the peculiar interest of the apostolic see, and his innocence was unanimously declared in a council of fifty bishops of Italy. At the end of three years, the primate was summoned to the court of Milan by the emperor Constans, who, in the indulgence of unlawful pleasures, still professed a lively regard for the orthodox faith. The cause of truth and justice was promoted by the influence of gold, and the ministers of Constans advised their sovereign to require the convocation of an ecclesiastical assembly, which might act as the representatives of the Catholic Church. Ninety-four bishops of the West, seventy-six bishops of the East, encountered each other at Sardica, on the verge of the two empires, but in the dominions of the protector of Athanasius. Their debates soon degenerated into hostile altercations. The Asiatics, apprehensive for their personal safety, retired to Philippopolis and Thrace, and the rival synods reciprocally hurled their spiritual thunders against their enemies, whom they piously condemned as the enemies of the true God. Their decrees were published and ratified in their respective provinces, and Athanasius, who in the West was revered as a saint, was exposed as a criminal to the abhorrence of the East, 
the Council of Sardica reveals the first symptoms of discord and schism between the Greek and Latin churches, which were separated by the accidental difference of faith, and the permanent distinction of language. During his second exile in the West, Athanasius was frequently admitted to the imperial presence, at Capua, Lodi, Milan, Verona, Padua, Aquileia, and Treves. The bishop of the diocese usually assisted at these interviews. The master of the offices stood before the veil or curtain of the sacred apartment, and the uniform moderation of the primate might be attested by these respectable witnesses, to whose evidence he solemnly appeals. Prudence would undoubtedly suggest the mild and respectful tone that became a subject and a bishop. In these familiar conferences with the sovereign of the West, Athanasius might lament the error of Constantius, but he boldly arraigned the guilt of his eunuchs and his Arian prelates, deplored the distress and danger of the Catholic Church, and excited Constance to emulate the zeal and glory of his father. The emperor declared his resolution of employing the troops and treasures of Europe in the Orthodox cause, and signified, by a concise and peremptory epistle to his brother Constantius, that unless he consented to the immediate restoration of Athanasius, he himself, with a fleet and army, would seat the archbishop on the throne of Alexandria. But this religious war, so horrible to nature, was prevented by the timely compliance of Constantius, and the emperor of the East condescended to solicit a reconciliation with a subject whom he had injured. Athanasius waited with decent pride till he had received three successive epistles full of the strongest assurances of his protection, the favor and the esteem of his sovereign, who invited him to resume his episcopal seat, and who added the humiliating precaution of engaging his principal ministers to attest the sincerity of his intentions. They were manifested in a still more public manner, by the strict orders which were dispatched into Egypt to recall the adherents of Athanasius, to restore their privileges, to proclaim their innocence, and to erase from the public registers the illegal proceedings which had been obtained during the prevalence of the Eusebian faction. After every satisfaction and security had been given, which justice or even delicacy could require, the primate proceeded, by slow journeys, through the provinces of Thrace, Asia, and Syria and his progress was marked by the abject homage of the Oriental bishops, who excited his contempt without deceiving his penetration. At Antioch he saw the Emperor Constantius, sustained, with modest firmness, the embraces and protestations of his master, and eluded the proposal of allowing the Arians a single church at Alexandria, by claiming, in the other cities of the empire, a similar toleration for his own party, a reply which might have appeared just and moderate in the mouth of an independent prince. The entrance of the archbishop into his capital was a triumphal procession. Absence and persecution had endeared him to the Alexandrians. His authority, which he exercised with rigor, was more firmly established, and his fame was diffused from Ethiopia to Britain, over the whole extent of the Christian world. But the subject who has reduced his prince to the necessity of dissembling can never expect a sincere and lasting forgiveness, and the tragic fate of Constance soon deprived Athanasius of a powerful and generous protector. The civil war between the assassin and the only surviving brother of Constans, which afflicted the empire above three years, secured an interval of repose to the Catholic Church, and the two contending parties were desirous to conciliate the friendship of a bishop, who by the weight of his personal authority might determine the fluctuating resolutions of an important province. He gave audience to the ambassadors of the tyrant, with whom he was afterwards accused of holding secret correspondence, and the Emperor Constantius repeatedly assured his dearest father, the most reverend Athanasius, that notwithstanding the malicious rumors which were circulated by their common enemies, he had inherited the sentiments, as well as the throne, of his deceased brother. Gratitude and humanity would have disposed the primate of Egypt to deplore the untimely fate of Constans, and to abhor the guilt of Magnentius, but as he clearly understood that the apprehensions of Constantius were his only safeguard, the fervor of his prayers for the success of the righteous cause might perhaps be somewhat evaded. The ruin of Athanasius was no longer contrived by the obscure malice of a few bigoted or angry bishops, who abused the authority of a credulous monarch. The monarch himself avowed the resolution, which he had so long suppressed, of avenging his private injuries, and the first winter after his victory, which he passed at Arlai, was employed against an enemy more odious to him than the vanquished tyrant of Gaul. If the emperor had capriciously decreed the death of the most eminent and virtuous citizen of the republic, the cruel order would have been executed without hesitation, by the ministers of open violence or of specious injustice. The caution, the delay, the difficulty with which he proceeded into the condemnation and punishment of a popular bishop, discovered to the world that the privileges of the Church had already revived a sense of order and freedom in the Roman government. 
The sentence, which was pronounced in the Synod of Tyre, and subscribed by a large majority of the Eastern bishops, had never been expressly repealed. And as Athanasius had been once degraded from his episcopal dignity by the judgment of his brethren, every subsequent act might be considered as irregular, and even criminal. But the memory of the firm and effectual support which the primate of Egypt had derived from the attachment of the Western Church engaged Constantius to suspend the execution of the sentence till he had obtained the concurrence of the Latin bishops. Two years were consumed in ecclesiastical negotiations, and the important cause between the emperor and one of his subjects was solemnly debated, first in the synod of Arles, and afterward in the great council of Milan, which consisted of above three hundred bishops. Their integrity was gradually undermined by the arguments of the Arians, the dexterity of the eunuchs, and the pressing solicitations of a prince who gratified his revenge at the expense of his dignity, and exposed his own passions whilst he influenced those of the clergy. Corruption, the most infallible symptom of constitutional liberty, was successfully practised. Honours, gifts, and immunities were offered and accepted as the price of an episcopal vote, and the condemnation of the Alexandrian primate was artfully represented as the only measure which could restore the peace and union of the Catholic Church. The friends of Athanasius were not, however, wanting to their leader or to their cause. With a manly spirit, which the sanctity of their character rendered less dangerous, they maintained, in public debate and in private conference with the emperor, the eternal obligation of religion and justice. They declared that neither the hope of his favour nor the fear of his displeasure should prevail on them to join in the condemnation of an absent, an innocent, and a respectable brother. They affirmed, with apparent reason, that the illegal and obsolete decrees of the Council of Tyre had long since been tacitly abolished by the imperial edicts, the honourable re-establishment of the Archbishop of Alexandria, and the silence or recantation of his most clamorous adversaries. They alleged that his innocence had been attested by the unanimous bishops of Egypt, and had been acknowledged in the councils of Rome and Sardica by the impartial judgment of the Latin Church. They deplored the hard condition of Athanasius, who, after enjoying so many years his seat, his reputation, and the seeming confidence of his sovereign, was again called upon to confute the most groundless and extravagant accusations. Their language was specious, their conduct was honourable, but in this long and obstinate contest, which fixed the eyes of the whole empire on a single bishop, the ecclesiastical factions were prepared to sacrifice truth and justice to the more interesting object of defending or removing the intrepid champion of the Nicene faith. The Arians still thought it prudent to disguise in ambiguous language their real sentiments and designs, but the orthodox bishops, armed with the favour of the people and the decrees of a general council, insisted on every occasion, and particularly at Milan, that their adversaries should purge themselves from the suspicion of heresy, before they presumed to arraign the conduct of the great Athanasius. But the voice of reason, if reason was indeed on the side of Athanasius, was silenced by the clamours of a factious or venal majority and the councils of Arles and Milan were not dissolved till the Archbishop of Alexandria had been solemnly conducted and deposed by the judgment of the Western as well as of the Eastern Church. The bishops who had opposed were required to subscribe the sentence, and to unite in religious communion with the suspected leaders of the adverse party. A formulary of consent was transmitted by the messengers of state to the absent bishops, and all those who refused to submit their private opinion to the public and inspired wisdom of the councils of Arles and Milan were immediately banished by the emperor, who affected to execute the decrees of the Catholic Church. Among those prelates who led the honourable band of confessors and exiles, Liberius of Rome, Osius of Cordoba, Paulinus of Treves, Dionysius of Milan, Eusebius of Vercelli, Lucifer of Cagliari, and Hilary of Poitiers, might deserve to be particularly distinguished. The eminent station of Liberius, who governed the capital of the empire, the personal merit and long experience of the venerable Osius, who was revered as the favourite of the great Constantine, and the father of the Nicene faith, placed those prelates at the head of the Latin Church, and their example, either of submission or resistance, would probably be imitated by the episcopal crowd. But the repeated attempts of the emperor to seduce or to intimidate the bishops of Rome and Cordoba were for some time ineffectual. The Spaniard declared himself ready to suffer under Constantius, as he had suffered threescore years before under his grandfather Maximian. The Roman, in the presence of his sovereign, asserted the innocence of Athanasius and his own freedom. When he was banished to Berea in Thrace, he sent back a large sum which had been offered for the accommodation of his journey, and insulted the court of Milan by the haughty remark that the emperor and his eunuchs might want that gold to pay their soldiers and their bishops. 
The resolution of Liberius and Osius was at length subdued by the hardships of exile and confinement. The Roman pontiff purchased his return by some criminal compliances, and afterwards expiated his guilt by a seasonable repentance. Persuasion and violence were employed to extort the reluctant signature of the decrepit bishop of Cordoba, whose strength was broken, and whose faculties were perhaps impaired by the weight of a hundred years, and the insolent triumph of the Arians provoked some of the orthodox party to treat with inhuman severity the character, or rather the memory, of an unfortunate old man, to whose former services Christianity itself was so deeply indebted. The fall of Liberius and Osius reflected a brighter luster on the firmness of those bishops who still adhered, with unshaken fidelity, to the cause of Athanasius and the religious truth. The ingenious malice of their enemies had deprived them of the benefit of mutual comfort and advice, separated those illustrious exiles into distant provinces, and carefully selected the most inhospitable spots of a great empire. Yet they soon experienced that the deserts of Libya, and the most barbarous tracts of Cappadocia, were less inhospitable than the residence of those cities in which an Arian bishop could satiate, without restraint, the exquisite rancor of theological hatred. Their consolation was derived from the consciousness of rectitude and independence, from the applause, the visits, the letters, and the liberal alms of their adherents, and from the satisfaction which they soon enjoyed of observing the intestine divisions of the adversaries of the Nicene faith. Such was the nice and capricious taste of Emperor Constantius, and so easily was he offended by the slightest deviation from his imaginary standard of Christian truth, that he persecuted with equal zeal those who defended the consubstantiality, those who asserted the similar substance, and those who denied the likeness of the Son of God. Three bishops, degraded and banished for those adverse opinions, might possibly meet in the same place of exile, and according to the difference of their temper, might either pity or insult the blind enthusiasm of their antagonists, whose present sufferings would never be compensated by future happiness. The disgrace and exile of the orthodox bishops of the West were designed as so many preparatory steps to the ruin of Athanasius himself. Six and twenty months had elapsed, during which the imperial court secretly laboured, by the most insidious arts, to remove him from Alexandria, and to withdraw the allowance which supplied his popular liberality. But, when the primate of Egypt, deserted and prohibited by the Latin church, was left destitute of any foreign support, Constantius dispatched two of his secretaries, with a verbal commission to announce and execute the order of his banishment. As the justice of the sentence was publicly avowed by the whole party, the only motive which could restrain Constantius from giving his messengers the sanction of a written mandate must be imputed to his doubt of the event, and to a sense of the danger to which he might expose the second city, and the most fertile province of the empire, if the people should persist in their resolution of defending by force of arms the innocence of their spiritual father. Such extreme caution afforded Athanasius a specious pretense respectfully to dispute the truth of an order, which he could not reconcile either with the equity or with the former declarations of his gracious master. The civil powers of Egypt found themselves inadequate to the task of persuading or compelling the primate to abdicate his episcopal throne, and they were obliged to conclude a treaty with the popular leaders of Alexandria, by which it was stipulated that all proceedings and all hostilities should be suspended till the emperor's pleasure had been more distinctly ascertained. By this immoderation, the Catholics were deceived into a false and fatal security, while the legions of the Upper Egypt and of Libya advanced by secret orders and hasty marches to besiege, or rather to surprise, a capital habituated to sedition, and inflamed by religious zeal. The position of Alexandria, between the sea and the Lake Mariotis, facilitated the approach and landing of the troops, who were introduced into the heart of the city, before any effectual measure could be taken either to shut the gates or to occupy the important posts of defence. At the hour of midnight, twenty-three days after the signature of the treaty, Syrianus, Duke of Egypt, at the head of five thousand soldiers, armed and prepared for an assault, unexpectedly invested the church of St. Theonus, where the archbishop, with part of his clergy and people, performed their nocturnal devotions. The doors of the sacred edifice yielded to the impetuosity of the attack, which was accompanied with every horrid circumstance of tumult and bloodshed. But as the bodies of the slain and the fragments of military weapons remained the next day an unexceptionable evidence in the possession of the Catholics, the enterprise of Syrianus may be considered as a successful eruption, rather than as an absolute conquest. The other churches of the city were profaned by similar outrages, and during at least four months Alexandria was exposed to the insults of a licentious army, stimulated by the ecclesiastics of a hostile faction, 
many of the faithful were killed, who may deserve the name of martyrs if their deaths were neither provoked nor revenge. Bishops and presbyters were treated with cruel ignominy. Consecrated virgins were stripped naked, scourged, and violated. The houses of wealthy citizens were plundered, and under the mask of religious zeal, lust, avarice, and private resentment were gratified with impunity and even applause. The pagans of Alexandria, who still formed a numerous and discontented party, were easily persuaded to desert a bishop whom they feared and esteemed. The hopes of some peculiar favors, and the apprehension of being involved in the general penalties of rebellion, engaged them to promise their support to the destined successor of Athanasius, the famous George of Cappadocia. The usurper, after receiving the consecration of an Arian synod, was placed on the episcopal throne by the arms of Sebastian, who had been appointed Count of Egypt for the execution of that important design. In the use, as well as in the acquisition of power, the tyrant, George, disregarded the laws of religion, of justice, and of humanity, and the same scenes of violence and scandal which had been exhibited in the capital were repeated in more than ninety episcopal cities of Egypt. Encouraged by success, Constantius ventured to approve the conduct of his minister. By a public and passionate epistle, the emperor congratulates the deliverance of Alexandria from a popular tyrant, who deluded his blind votaries by the magic of his eloquence, expatiates on the virtues and piety of the most reverend George, the elected bishop, and aspires, as the patron and benefactor of the city, to surpass the fame of Alexander himself. But he solemnly declares his unalterable resolution to pursue with fire and sword the seditious adherence of the wicked Athanasius, who by flying from justice has confessed his guilt and escaped the ignominious death which he had so often deserved. End of chapter 21, part 5《Chapter Twenty One, Part Six of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Twenty One: Persecution of Heresy, State of the Church, Part Six. Athanasius had indeed escaped from the most imminent dangers and the adventures of that extraordinary man deserve and fix our attention. On the memorable night when the church of St. Theonus was invested by the troops of Syrianus, the archbishop, seated on his throne, expected with calm and intrepid dignity the approach of death. While the public devotion was interrupted by shouts of rage and cries of terror, he animated his trembling congregation to express their religious confidence, by chanting one of the psalms of David which celebrates the triumph of the God of Israel over the haughty and impious tyrant of Egypt. The doors were at length burst open, a cloud of arrows was discharged among the people, the soldiers with drawn swords rushed forwards into the sanctuary, and the dreadful gleam of their arms was reflected by the holy luminaries which burnt round the altar. Athanasius still rejected the pious importunity of the monks and presbyters, who were attached to his person, and nobly refused to desert his episcopal station, till he had dismissed in safety the last of the congregation. The darkness and tumult of the night favored the retreat of the archbishop, and though he was oppressed by the waves of an agitated multitude, though he was thrown to the ground and left without sense or motion, he still recovered his undaunted courage, and eluded the eager search of the soldiers, who were instructed by their Arian guides, that the head of Athanasius would be the most acceptable present to the emperor. From that moment the primate of Egypt disappeared from the eyes of his enemies, and remained above six years concealed in impenetrable obscurity. The despotic power of his implacable enemy filled the whole extent of the Roman world, and the exasperated monarch had endeavored, by a very pressing epistle to the Christian princes of Ethiopia, to exclude Athanasius from the most remote and sequestered regions of the earth. Counts, prefects, tribunes, whole armies were successively employed to pursue a bishop and a fugitive. The vigilance of the civil and military powers was excited by the imperial edicts. Liberal rewards were promised to the man who should produce Athanasius, either alive or dead and the most severe penalties were denounced against those who should dare to protect the public enemy. But the deserts of Thebais were now peopled by a race of wild, yet submissive fanatics, 
who preferred the commands of their abbot to the laws of their sovereign. The numerous disciples of Antony and Pacomius received the fugitive primate as their father, admired the patience and humility with which he conformed to their strictest institutions, collected every word which dropped from his lips as the genuine effusions of inspired wisdom, and persuaded themselves that their prayers, their fasts, and their vigils were less meritorious than the zeal which they expressed, and the dangers which they braved in the defense of truth and innocence. The monasteries of Egypt were seated in lonely and desolate places, on the summits of mountains, or in the islands of the Nile, and the sacred horn or trumpet of Tabin was the well-known signal which assembled several thousand robust and determined monks, who for the most part had been the peasants of the adjacent country. When their dark retreats were invaded by a military force, which it was impossible to resist, they silently stretched out their necks to the executioner, and supported their national character, that tortures could never wrest from an Egyptian the confession of a secret which he was resolved not to disclose. The Archbishop of Alexandria, for whose safety they eagerly devoted their lives, was lost among a uniform and well-disciplined multitude, and on the nearer approach of danger he was swiftly removed by their officious hands from one place of concealment to another, till he reached the formidable deserts, which the gloomy and credulous temper of superstition had peopled with demons and savage monsters. The retirement of Athanasius, which ended only with the life of Constantius, was spent for the most part in the society of the monks, who faithfully served him as guards, as secretaries, and as messengers. But the importance of maintaining a more intimate connection with the Catholic party tempted him, whenever the diligence of the pursuit was abated, to emerge from the desert, to introduce himself into Alexandria, and to trust his person to the discretion of his friends and adherents. His various adventures might have furnished the subject of a very entertaining romance. He was once secreted in a dry cistern, which he had scarcely left before he was betrayed by the treachery of a female slave, and he was once concealed in a still more extraordinary asylum, the house of a virgin only twenty years of age, and who was celebrated in the whole city for her exquisite beauty. At the hour of midnight, as she related the story many years afterwards, she was surprised by the appearance of the archbishop in a loose undress, who, advancing with hasty steps, conjured her to afford him the protection which he had been directed by a celestial vision to seek under her hospitable roof. The pious maid accepted and preserved the sacred pledge which was entrusted to her prudence and courage. Without imparting the secret to any one, she instantly conducted Athanasius to her most secret chamber, and watched over his safety with the tenderness of a friend and the assiduity of a servant. As long as the danger continued, she regularly supplied him with books and provisions, washed his feet, managed his correspondence, and dexterously concealed from the eye of suspicion this familiar and solitary intercourse between a saint whose character required the most unblemished chastity, and a female whose charms might excite the most dangerous emotions. During the six years of persecution and exile, Athanasius repeated his visits to his fair and faithful companion, and the formal declaration that he saw the councils of Rimini and Seleucia forces us to believe that he was secretly present at the time and place of their convocation. The advantage of personally negotiating with his friends, and of observing and improving the divisions of his enemies, might justify in a prudent statesman so bold and dangerous an enterprise, and Alexandria was connected by trade and navigation with every seaport of the Mediterranean. From the depth of his inaccessible retreat the intrepid primate waged an incessant and offensive war against the protector of the Arians, and his seasonable writings, which were diligently circulated and eagerly perused, contributed to unite and animate the orthodox party. In his public apologies, which he addressed to the emperor himself, he sometimes affected the praise of moderation, whilst at the same time, in secret and vehement invectives, he exposed Constantius as a weak and wicked prince, the executioner of his family, the tyrant of the republic, and the antichrist of the church. In the height of his prosperity, the victorious monarch, who had chastised the rashness of Gallus, and suppressed the revolt of Sylvanus, 
who had taken the diadem from the head of Vitriano, and vanquished in the field the legions of Magnentius, received from an invisible hand a wound which he could neither heal nor revenge, and the son of Constantine was the first of the Christian princes who experienced the strength of those principles, which in the cause of religion could resist the most violent exertions of the civil power. The persecution of Athanasius, and of so many respectable bishops who suffered for the truth of their opinions, or at least for the integrity of their conscience, was a just subject of indignation and discontent to all Christians, except those who were blindly devoted to the Arian faction. The people regretted the loss of their faithful pastors, whose banishment was usually followed by the intrusion of a stranger into their episcopal chair, and loudly complained that the right of election was violated, and that they were condemned to obey a mercenary usurper, whose person was unknown, and whose principles were suspected." The Catholics might prove to the world that they were not involved in the guilt and heresy of their ecclesiastical governor, by publicly testifying their dissent, or by totally separating themselves from his communion. The first of these methods was invented at Antioch, and practiced with such success that it was soon diffused over the Christian world. The doxology, or sacred hymn, which celebrates the glory of the Trinity, is susceptible of very nice but material inflections and the substance of an orthodox or an heretical creed may be expressed by the differences of a disjunctive or a copulative particle. Alternate responses and a more regular psalmody were introduced into the public service by Flavianus and Diodorus, two devout and active laymen, who were attached to the Nicene faith. Under their conduct a swarm of monks issued from the adjacent desert. Bands of well-disciplined singers were stationed in the cathedral of Antioch the glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, was triumphantly chanted by a full chorus of voices, and the Catholics insulted by the purity of their doctrine the Arian prelate, who had usurped the throne of the venerable Eustathius. The same zeal which inspired their songs prompted the more scrupulous members of the Orthodox party to form separate assemblies which were governed by the presbyters, till the death of their exiled bishop allowed the election and consecration of a new episcopal pastor. The revolutions of the court multiplied the number of pretenders, and the same city was often disputed under the reign of Constantius by two or three or even four bishops, who exercised their spiritual jurisdiction over their respective followers, and alternately lost and regained the temporal possessions of the church. The abuse of Christianity introduced into the Roman government new causes of tyranny and sedition. The bands of civil society were torn asunder by the fury of religious factions, and the obscure citizen, who might calmly have surveyed the elevation and fall of successive emperors, imagined and experienced that his own life and fortune were connected with the interests of a popular ecclesiastic. The example of the two capitals, Rome and Constantinople, may serve to represent the state of the empire, and the temper of mankind, under the reign of the sons of Constantine. The Roman pontiff, as long as he maintained his station and his principles, was guarded by the warm attachment of a great people, and could reject with scorn the prayers, the menaces, and the obligations of an heretical prince. When the eunuchs had secretly pronounced the exile of Liberius, the well-grounded apprehension of a tumult engaged them to use the utmost precautions in the execution of the sentence. The capital was invested on every side, and the prefect was commanded to seize the person of the bishop, either by stratagem or by open force. The order was obeyed, and Liberius, with the greatest difficulty, at the hour of midnight, was swiftly conveyed beyond the reach of the Roman people before their consternation was turned into rage. As soon as they were informed of his banishment into Thrace, a general assembly was convened, and the clergy of Rome bound themselves, by a public and solemn oath, never to desert their bishop, never to acknowledge the usurper Felix, who, by the influence of the eunuchs, had been irregularly chosen and consecrated within the walls of a profane palace. At the end of two years their pious obstinacy subsisted entire and unshaken and when Constantius visited Rome he was assailed by the importunate solicitations of a people, who had preserved, as the last remnant of their ancient freedom, the right of treating their sovereign with familiar insolence. 
the wives of many of the senators and most honorable citizens, after pressing their husbands to intercede in favor of Liberius, were advised to undertake a commission in which their hands would be less dangerous, and might prove more successful. The emperor received with politeness these female deputies, whose wealth and dignity were displayed in the magnificence of their dress and ornaments. He admired their inflexible resolution of following their beloved pastor to the most distant regions of the earth, and consented that the two bishops, Liberius and Felix, should govern in peace their respective congregations. But the ideas of toleration were so repugnant to the practice, and even to the sentiments of those times, that when the answer of Constantius was publicly read in the circus of Rome, so reasonable a project of accommodation was rejected with contempt and ridicule. The eager vehemence which animated the spectators in the decisive moment of a horse-race was now directed towards a different object, and the circus resounded with the shout of thousands who repeatedly exclaimed, One God, one Christ, one Bishop. The zeal of the Roman people in the cause of Liberius was not confined to words alone, and the dangerous and bloody sedition which they excited soon after the departure of Constantius determined that prince to accept the submission of the exiled prelate, and to restore him to the undivided dominion of the capital. After some ineffectual resistance, his rival was expelled from the city by the permission of the emperor, and the power of the opposite faction. The adherents of Felix were inhumanely murdered in the streets, in the public places, in the baths, and even in the churches, and the face of Rome, upon the return of a Christian bishop, renewed the horrid image of the massacre of Marius and the prescriptions of Scylla. Notwithstanding the rapid increase of Christians under the reign of the Flavian family, Rome, Alexandria, and the other great cities of the empire still contained a strong and powerful faction of infidels, who envied the prosperity and who ridiculed, even in their theatres, the theological disputes of the church. Constantinople alone enjoyed the advantage of being born and educated in the bosom of the faith. The capital of the East had never been polluted by the worship of idols, and the whole body of the people had deeply imbibed the opinions, the virtues, and the passions, which distinguished the Christians of that age from the rest of mankind. After the death of Alexander, the episcopal throne was disputed by Paul and Macedonius. By their zeal and abilities they both deserved the eminent station to which they aspired, and if the moral character of Macedonius was less exceptionable, his competitor had the advantage of a prior election and a more orthodox doctrine. His firm attachment to the Nicene Creed, which has given Paul a place in the calendar among saints and martyrs, exposed him to the resentment of the Arians. In the space of fourteen years he was five times driven from his throne, to which he was more frequently restored by the violence of the people than by the permission of the prince, and the power of Macedonius could be secured only by the death of his rival. The unfortunate Paul was dragged in chains from the sandy deserts of Mesopotamia to the most desolate places of Mount Taurus, confined in a dark and narrow dungeon, left six days without food, and at length strangled by the order of Philip, one of the principal ministers of the Emperor Constantius. The first blood which stained the new capital was spilt in this ecclesiastical contest, and many persons were slain on both sides in the furious and obstinate seditions of the people. The commission of enforcing a sentence of banishment against Paul had been entrusted to Hermogenes, the master-general of the cavalry, but the execution of it was fatal to himself. The Catholics rose in defense of their bishop. The palace of Hermogenes was consumed. The first military officer of the empire was dragged by the heels through the streets of Constantinople, and after he expired his lifeless corpse was exposed to their wanton insults. The fate of Hermogenes instructed Philip, the praetorian prefect, to act with more precaution on a similar occasion. In the most gentle and honorable terms he required the attendance of Paul in the baths of Zeuxippus, which had a private communication with the palace and the sea. A vessel which lay ready at the garden stairs immediately hoisted sail, and, while the people were still ignorant of the meditated sacrilege, their bishop was already embarked on his voyage to Thessalonica. They soon beheld with surprise and indignation the gates of the palace thrown open, and the usurper Macedonius seated by the side of the prefect on a lofty chariot, which was surrounded by troops of guards with drawn swords. 
The military procession advanced towards the cathedral, the Arians and the Catholics eagerly rushed to occupy that important post, and three thousand one hundred and fifty persons lost their lives in the confusion of the tumult. Macedonius, who was supported by a regular force, obtained a decisive victory, but his reign was disturbed by clamor and sedition, and the causes which appeared the least connected with the subject of dispute were sufficient to nourish and to kindle the flame of civil discord. As the chapel in which the body of the great Constantine had been deposited was in a ruinous condition, the bishop transported those venerable remains into the church of St. Acacius. This prudent and even pious measure was represented as a wicked profanation by the whole party which adhered to the Homusian doctrine. The factions immediately flew to arms, the consecrated ground was used as their field of battle, and one of the ecclesiastical historians has observed, as a real fact, not as a figure of rhetoric, that the well before the church overflowed with a stream of blood, which filled the porticos and the adjacent courts. The writer who should impute these tumults solely to a religious principle would betray a very imperfect knowledge of human nature. Yet it must be confessed that the motive which misled the sincerity of zeal, and the pretense which disguised the licentiousness of passion, suppressed the remorse which, in another cause, would have succeeded to the rage of the Christians at Constantinople. End of chapter 21, part 6《Part Seven of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. *** The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Twenty One: Persecution of Heresy, State of the Church, Part Seven. The cruel and arbitrary disposition of Constantius, which did not always require the provocations of guilt and resistance, was justly exasperated by the tumults of his capital, and the criminal behavior of a faction, which opposed the authority and religion of their sovereign. The ordinary punishments of death, exile, and confiscation were inflicted with partial vigor, and all the Greeks still revere the holy memory of two clerks, a reader, and a subdeacon who were accused of the murder of Hermogenes, and beheaded at the gates of Constantinople. By an edict of Constantius against the Catholics, which has not been judged worthy of a place in the Theodosian Code, those who refused to communicate with the Arian bishops, and particularly with Macedonius, were deprived of the immunities of ecclesiastics, and the rights of the Christians. They were compelled to relinquish the possession of the churches, and were strictly prohibited from holding their assemblies within the walls of the city. The execution of this unjust law in the provinces of Thrace and Asia Minor was committed to the zeal of Macedonius. The civil and military powers were directed to obey his commands, and the cruelties exercised by this semi-Aryan tyrant in the support of the Homotian exceeded the commission and disgraced the reign of Constantius. The sacraments of the church were administered to the reluctant victims who denied the vocation and abhorred the principles of Macedonius. The rites of baptism were conferred on women and children, who for that purpose had been torn from the arms of their friends and parents. The mouths of the communicants were held open by a wooden engine, while the consecrated bread was forced down their throat. The breasts of tender virgins were either burnt with red-hot eggshells, or inhumanely compressed between sharp and heavy boards. The Novatians of Constantinople and the adjacent country, by their firm attachment to the Humusian standard, deserved to be confounded with the Catholics themselves. Macedonius was informed that a large district of Paphlagonia was almost entirely inhabited by these sectaries. He resolved either to convert or extirpate them, and as he distrusted on this occasion the efficacy of an ecclesiastical mission, he commanded a body of four thousand legionaries to march against the rebels, and to reduce the territory of Mantinium under his spiritual division. The Novatian peasants, animated by despair and religious fury, boldly encountered the invaders of their country, and though many of the Paphlagonians were slain, the Roman legions were vanquished by an irregular multitude, armed only with cists and axes, and, except a few who escaped by ignominious flight, four thousand soldiers were left dead on the field of battle. 
The successor of Constantius has expressed, in a concise but lively manner, some of the theological calamities which afflicted the empire, and more especially the east, in the reign of a prince who was the slave of his own passions, and those of his eunuchs. Many were imprisoned, and persecuted, and driven into exile. Whole troops of those who are styled heretics were massacred, particularly at Sisychus and at Samosata. In Paphlagonia, Bithynia, Galatia, and many other provinces, towns and villages were laid waste and utterly destroyed. While the flames of the Arian controversy consumed the vitals of the empire, the African provinces were infested by their peculiar enemies, the savage fanatics, who, under the name of Circumcellians, formed the strength and scandal of the Donatist party. The severe execution of the laws of Constantine had excited a spirit of discontent and resistance. The strenuous efforts of his son Constans to restore the unity of the church exasperated the sentiments of mutual hatred, which had at first occasioned the separation. And the methods of force and corruption employed by the two imperial commissioners, Paul and Macarius, furnished the schismatics with a specious contrast between the maxims of the apostles and the conduct of their pretended successors. The peasants who inhabited the villages of Numidia and Mauritania were a ferocious race, who had been imperfectly reduced under the authority of the Roman laws, who were imperfectly converted to the Christian faith, but who were actuated by a blind and furious enthusiasm in the cause of their Donatist teachers. They indignantly supported the exile of their bishops, the demolition of their churches, and the interruption of their secret assemblies. The violence of the officers of justice, who were usually sustained by a military guard, was sometimes repelled with equal violence, and the blood of some popular ecclesiastics, which had been shed in the quarrel, inflamed their rude followers with an eager desire of revenging the death of these holy martyrs. By their own cruelty and rashness, the ministers of persecution sometimes provoked their fate, and the guilt of an accidental tumult precipitated the criminals into despair and rebellion. Driven from their native villages, the Donatist peasants assembled in formidable gangs on the edge of the Getulian desert, and readily exchanged the habits of labor for a life of idleness and rapine, which was consecrated by the name of religion and faintly condemned by the doctors of the sect. The leaders of the Circumcellians assumed the title of Captains of the Saints. Their principal weapon, as they were indifferently provided with swords and spears, was a huge and weighty club, which they termed an Israelite, and the well-known sound of praise be to God which they used as their cry of war diffused consternation over the unarmed provinces of Africa. At first their depredations were colored by the plea of necessity, but they soon exceeded the measure of subsistence, indulged without control their intemperance and avarice, burnt the villages which they had pillaged, and reigned the licentious tyrants of the open country. The occupations of husbandry and the administration of justice were interrupted, and, as the Circumcellians pretended to restore the primitive equality of mankind, and to reform the abuses of civil society, they opened a secure asylum for the slaves and debtors who flocked in crowds to their holy standard. When they were not resisted, they usually contented themselves with plunder, but the slightest opposition provoked them to acts of violence and murder, and some Catholic priests, who had imprudently signaled their zeal, were tortured by the fanatics with the most refined and wanton barbarity. The spirit of the Circumcellians was not always exerted against their defenseless enemies. They engaged and sometimes defeated the troops of the province and in the bloody action of Bagai they attacked in the open field, but with unsuccessful valor, an advanced guard of the imperial cavalry. The Donatists, who were taken in arms, received, and they soon deserved, the same treatment which might have been shown to the wild beasts of the desert. The captives died without murmur, either by the sword, the axe, or the fire, and the measures of retaliation were multiplied in a rapid proportion, which aggravated the horrors of rebellion, and excluded the hope of mutual forgiveness. In the beginning of the present century, the example of the Circumcellions has been renewed in the persecution, the boldness, the crimes, and the enthusiasm of the Camisards. And if the fanatics of Languedoc surpassed those of Numidia, by their military achievements, 
the Africans maintained their fierce independence, with more resolution and perseverance. Such disorders are the natural effects of religious tyranny, but the rage of the Donatists was inflamed by a frenzy of a very extraordinary kind, and which, if it really prevailed among them in so extravagant a degree, cannot surely be paralleled in any country or in any age. Many of these fanatics were possessed with the horror of life and the desire of martyrdom, and they deemed it of little moment by what means, or by what hands, they perished, if their conduct was sanctified by the intention of devoting themselves to the glory of the true faith, and the hope of eternal happiness. Sometimes they rudely disturbed the festivals, and profaned the temples of paganism, with the design of exciting the most zealous of the idolaters to revenge the insulted honor of their gods. They sometimes forced their way into the courts of justice, and compelled the affrighted judge to give orders for their immediate execution. They frequently stopped travelers on the public highways, and obliged them to inflict the stroke of martyrdom, by the promise of a reward if they consented, and by the threat of instant death if they refused to grant so very singular a favor. When they were disappointed of every other resource, they announced the day on which, in the presence of their friends and brethren, they should east themselves headlong from some lofty rock, and many precipices were shown which had acquired fame by the number of religious suicides. In the actions of these desperate enthusiasts, who were admired by one party as the martyrs of God, and abhorred by the others as the victims of Satan, an impartial philosopher may discover the influence and the last abuse of that inflexible spirit which was originally derived from the character and principles of the Jewish nation. The simple narrative of the intestine divisions, which distracted the peace and dishonored the triumph of the church, will confirm the remark of a pagan historian, and justify the complaint of a venerable bishop. The experience of Ammianus had convinced him that the enmity of the Christians towards each other surpassed the fury of savage beasts against man, and Gregory Nazianin most pathetically laments that the kingdom of heaven was converted by discord into the image of chaos of a nocturnal tempest, and of hell itself. The fierce and partial writers of the times, ascribing all virtue to themselves, and imputing all guilt to their adversaries, have painted the battle of the angels and demons. Our calmer reason will reject such pure and perfect monsters of vice or sanctity, and will impute an equal, or at least an indiscriminate, measure of good and evil to the hostile sectaries, who assumed and bestowed the appellations of orthodox and heretics. They had been educated in the same religion and in the same civil society. Their hopes and fears in the present or in a future life were balanced in the same proportion. On either side the error might be innocent, the faith sincere, the practice meritorious or corrupt. The passions were excited by similar objects, and they might alternately abuse the favor of the court or of the people. The metaphysical opinions of the Athanasians and the Arians could not influence their moral character, and they were alike actuated by the intolerable spirit which has been extracted from the pure and simple maxims of the gospel. A modern writer who, with a just confidence, has prefixed to his own history the honorable epithets of political and philosophical, accuses the timid prudence of Montesquieu, for neglecting to enumerate, among the causes of the decline of the empire, a law of Constantine, by which the exercise of the pagan worship was absolutely suppressed, and a considerable part of his subjects was left destitute of priests, of temples, and of any public religion. The zeal of the philosophic historian for the rights of mankind has induced him to acquiesce in the ambiguous testimony of those ecclesiastics, who have too lightly ascribed to their favorite hero the merit of a general persecution. Instead of alleging this imaginary law, which would have blazed in the front of the imperial codes, we may safely appeal to the original epistle, which Constantine addressed to the followers of the ancient religion, at a time when he no longer disguised his conversion, or dreaded the rivals of his throne. He invites and exhorts, in the most pressing terms, the subjects of the Roman Empire to imitate the example of their master. But he declares that those who still refuse to open their eyes to the celestial light may freely enjoy their temples and their fancied gods. 
A report that the ceremonies of paganism were suppressed is formally contradicted by the emperor himself, who wisely assigns, as the principle of his moderation, the invincible force of habit, of prejudice, and of superstition. Without violating the sanctity of his promise, without alarming the fears of the pagans, the artful monarch advanced, by slow and cautious steps, to undermine the irregular and decayed fabric of polytheism. The partial acts of severity which he occasionally exercised, though they were secretly promoted by a Christian zeal, were colored by the faintest pretenses of justice and the public good, and while Constantine designed to ruin the foundations, he seemed to reform the abuses of the ancient religion. After the example of the wisest of his predecessors, he condemned, under the most rigorous penalties, the occult and impious acts of divination, which excited the vain hopes, and sometimes the criminal attempts, of those who were discontented with their present condition. An ignominious silence was imposed on the oracles, which had been publicly convicted of fraud and falsehood. The effeminate priests of the Nile were abolished, and Constantine discharged the duties of a Roman censor, when he gave orders for the demolition of several temples of Phoenicia, in which every mode of prostitution was devoutly practiced in the face of the day, and to the honor of Venus. The imperial city of Constantinople was, in some measure, raised at the expense, and was adorned with the spoils of the opulent temples of Greece and Asia. The sacred property was confiscated, the statues of gods and heroes were transported, with rude familiarity, among a people who considered them as objects, not of adoration, but of curiosity. The gold and silver were restored to circulation, and the magistrates, the bishops, and the eunuchs improved the fortunate occasion of gratifying at once their zeal, their avarice, and their resentment. But these depredations were confined to a small part of the Roman world, and the provinces had been long accustomed to endure the same sacrilegious rapine from the tyranny of princes and proconsuls, who could not be suspected of any design to subvert the established religion. The sons of Constantine trod in the footsteps of their father, with more zeal and with less discretion. The pretenses of rapine and oppression were insensibly multiplied. Every indulgence was shown to the illegal behavior of the Christians. Every doubt was explained to the disadvantage of paganism, and the demolition of the temples was celebrated as one of the auspicious events of the reign of Constans and Constantius. The name of Constantius is prefixed to a concise law which might have superseded the necessity of any future prohibitions. It is our pleasure that in all places and in all cities the temples be immediately shut, and carefully guarded that none may have the power of offending. It is likewise our pleasure that all our subjects should abstain from sacrifices. If any one should be guilty of such an act, let him feel the sword of vengeance, and after his execution let his property be confiscated to the public use. We denounce the same penalties against the governors of the provinces if they neglect to punish the criminals. But there is the strongest reason to believe that this formidable edict was either composed without being published, or was published without being executed. The evidence of facts, and the monuments which are still extant of brass and marble, continue to prove the public exercise of the pagan worship during the whole reign of the sons of Constantine. In the east as well as in the west, in cities as well as in the country, a great number of temples were respected, or at least were spared and the devout multitude still enjoyed the luxury of sacrifices, of festivals, and of processions, by the permission or by the connivance of the civil government. About four years after the supposed date of this bloody edict, Constantius visited the temples of Rome, and the decency of his behavior is recommended by a pagan orator as an example worthy of the imitation of succeeding princes. That emperor, says Symmachus, suffered the privileges of the Vestal Virgins to remain inviolate. He bestowed the sacerdotal dignities on the nobles of Rome, granted the customary allowance to defray the expenses of the public rites and sacrifices, and though he had embraced a different religion, he never attempted to deprive the empire of the sacred worship of antiquity. The Senate still presumed to consecrate, by solemn decrees, the divine memory of their sovereigns, and Constantine himself was associated, after his death, to those gods whom he had renounced and insulted during his life. 
the title, the ensigns, the prerogatives of sovereign pontiff, which had been instituted by Numa and assumed by Augustus, were accepted without hesitation by seven Christian emperors, who were invested with more absolute authority over the religion which they had deserted than over that which they professed. The divisions of Christianity suspended the ruin of paganism, and the holy war against the infidels was less vigorously prosecuted by princes and bishops, who were more immediately alarmed by the guilt and danger of domestic rebellion. The extirpation of idolatry might have been justified by the established principles of intolerance, but the hostile sects which alternately reigned in the imperial court were mutually apprehensive of alienating, and perhaps exasperating, the mind of a powerful though declining faction. Every motive of authority and fashion, of interest and reason, now militated on the side of Christianity, but two or three generations elapsed before their victorious influence was universally felt. The religion which had so long and so lately been established in the Roman Empire was still revered by a numerous people, less attached indeed to speculative opinion than to ancient custom. The honors of the state and army were indifferently bestowed on all the subjects of Constantine and Constantius, and a considerable portion of knowledge and wealth and valor was still engaged in the service of polytheism. The superstition of the senator and of the peasant, of the poet and the philosopher, was derived from very different causes, but they met with equal devotion in the temples of the gods. Their zeal was insensibly provoked by the insulting triumph of a prescribed sect, and their hopes were revived by the well-grounded confidence that the presumptive heir of the empire, a young and valiant hero, who had delivered Gaul from the arms of the barbarians, had secretly embraced the religion of his ancestors. End of chapter 21, part 7「Chapter twenty two part one of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire volume two this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org chapter twenty two Julian is declared emperor by the legions of Gaul his march and success the death of Constantius civil administration of Julian while the Romans languished under the ignominious tyranny of eunuchs and bishops, the praises of Julian were repeated with transport in every part of the empire, except in the palace of Constantius. The barbarians of Germany had felt, and still dreaded, the arms of the young Caesar. His soldiers were the companions of his victory. The grateful provincials enjoyed the blessings of his reign. But the favorites, who had opposed his elevation, were offended by his virtues, and they justly considered the friend of the people as the enemy of the court. As long as the fame of Julian was doubtful, the buffoons of the palace, who were skilled in the language of satire, tried the efficacy of those arts which they had so often practiced with success. They easily discovered that his simplicity was not exempt from affectation. The ridiculous epithets of an hairy savage, of an ape invested with the purple, were applied to the dress and person of the philosophic warrior, and his modest dispatches were stigmatized by the vain and elaborate fictions of a loquacious Greek a speculative soldier, who has studied the art of war, amidst the groves of the academy. The voice of malicious folly was at length silenced by the shouts of victory. The conqueror of the Franks and Alemanni could no longer be painted as an object of contempt, and the monarch himself was meanly ambitious of stealing from his lieutenant the honorable reward of his labors. In the letters, crowned with laurel, which, according to ancient custom, were addressed to the provinces, the name of Julian was omitted. Constantius had made his dispositions in person, he had signalized his valor in the foremost ranks, his military conduct had secured the victory, and the captive king of the barbarians was presented to him on the field of battle, from which he was at that time distant above forty days' journey. So extravagant a fable was incapable, however, of deceiving the public credulity, or even of satisfying the pride of the emperor himself secretly conscious of the applause and favor of the Romans accompanied the rising fortunes of Julian, his discontented mind was prepared to receive the subtle poison of those artful sycophants who colored their mischievous designs with the fairest appearance of truth and candor. Instead of deprecating the merits of Julian, they acknowledged and even exaggerated his popular fame, superior talents, and important services.
but they darkly insinuated that the virtues of the Caesar might instantly be converted into the most dangerous crimes, if the inconstant multitude should prefer their inclinations to their duty, or if the general of a victorious army should be tempted from his allegiance by the hopes of revenge and independent greatness. The personal fears of Constantius were interpreted by his council as a laudable anxiety for the public safety, whilst in private, and perhaps in his own breast, he disguised, under the less odious appellation of fear, the sentiments of hatred and envy which he secretly conceived for the inimitable virtues of Julian. The apparent tranquility of Gaul and the imminent danger of the eastern provinces offered a specious pretense for the design which was artfully concerted by the imperial ministers. They resolved to disarm the Caesar, to recall those faithful troops who guarded his person and dignity, and to employ, in a distant war against the Persian monarch, the hardy veterans who had vanquished on the banks of the Rhine the fiercest nations of Germany. While Julian used the laborious hours of his winter quarters at Paris in the administration of power, which, in his hands, was the exercise of virtue, he was surprised by the hasty arrival of a tribune and notary, with positive orders from the emperor that they were directed to execute, and he was commanded not to oppose. Constantius signified his pleasure that four entire legions, the Celtae and Petulants, the Heruli and the Batavians, should be separated from the standard of Julian, under which they had acquired their fame and discipline, that in each of the remaining bands three hundred of the bravest youths should be selected, and that this numerous detachment, the strength of the Gallic army, should instantly begin their march and exert their utmost diligence to arrive before the opening of the campaign on the frontiers of Persia. The Caesar foresaw and lamented the consequences of that fateful mandate. Most of the auxiliaries, who had engaged their voluntary service, had stipulated that they should never be obliged to pass the Alps. The public faith of Rome, and the personal honor of Julian, had been pledged for the observance of this condition. Such an act of treachery and oppression would destroy the confidence and excite the resentment of the independent warriors of Germany, who considered truth as the noblest of their virtues, and freedom as the most valuable of their possessions. The legionaries, who had enjoyed the title and privileges of Romans, were enlisted for the general defense of the Republic. But those mercenary troops heard with cold indifference the antiquated names of the Republic and of Rome. Attached, either from birth or long habit, to the climate and manners of Gaul, they loved and admired Julian. They despised and perhaps hated the emperor. They dreaded the laborious march, the Persian arrows, and the burning deserts of Asia. They claimed as their own the country which they had saved, and excused their want of spirit by pleading the sacred and more immediate duty of protecting their families and friends. The apprehensions of the Gauls were derived from the knowledge of the impending and inevitable danger. As soon as the provinces were exhausted of their military strength, the Germans would violate a treaty which had been imposed on their fears, and notwithstanding the abilities and valor of Julian, the general of a nominal army, to whom the public calamities would be imputed, must find himself, after a vain resistance, either a prisoner in the camp of the barbarians, or a criminal in the palace of Constantius. If Julian complied with the orders which he had received, he subscribed his own destruction, and that of a people who deserved his affection. But a positive refusal was an act of rebellion and a declaration of war. The inexorable jealousy of the emperor, the peremptory and perhaps insidious nature of his commands, left not any room for a fair apology or a candid interpretation and the dependent station of the Caesar scarcely allowed him to pause or to deliberate. Solitude increased the perplexity of Julian. He could no longer apply to the faithful counsels of Sallust, who had been removed from his office by the judicious malice of the eunuchs. He could not even enforce his representations by the concurrence of the ministers, who would have been afraid or ashamed to approve the ruin of Gaul. The moment had been chosen when Lupicinus, the general of the cavalry was dispatched into Britain to repulse the inroads of the Scots and Picts, and Florentius was occupied at Vienne by the assessment of the tribute. The latter, a crafty and corrupt statesman, declining to assume a responsible part on this dangerous occasion, eluded the pressing and repeated invitations of Julian, who represented to him that, in every important measure, the presence of the prefect was indispensable in the council of the prince. In the meanwhile, the Caesar was oppressed by the rude and importunate solicitations of the imperial messengers, who presumed to suggest that, if he expected the return of his ministers, he would charge himself with the guilt of the delay, and reserve for them the merit of the execution. Unable to resist, unwilling to comply, 
Julian expressed in the most serious terms his wish, and even his intention, of resigning the purple, which he could not preserve with honor, which he could not abdicate with safety. After a painful conflict, Julian was compelled to acknowledge that obedience was the virtue of the most eminent subject, and that the sovereign alone was entitled to judge of the public welfare. He issued the necessary orders for carrying into execution the commands of Constantius. A part of the troops began their march for the Alps, and the detachments from the several garrisons moved towards their respective places of assembly. They advanced with difficulty through the trembling and affrighted crowds of provincials, who attempted to excite their pity by silent despair or loud lamentations, while the wives of the soldiers, holding their infants in their arms, accused the desertion of their husbands in the mixed language of grief, of tenderness, and of indignation. This scene of general distress afflicted the humanity of the Caesar. He granted a sufficient number of post-wagons to transport the wives and families of the soldiers, endeavored to alleviate the hardships which he was constrained to inflict, and increased, by the most laudable arts, his own popularity and the discontent of the exiled troops. The grief of an armed multitude is soon converted into rage. The licentious murmurs, which every hour were communicated from tent to tent with more boldness and effect, prepared their minds for the most daring act of sedition. And by the connivance of their tribunes, a seasonal libel was secretly dispersed, which painted in lively colors the disgrace of the Caesar, the oppression of the Gallic army, and the feeble vices of the tyrant of Asia. The servants of Constantius were astonished and alarmed by the progress of this dangerous spirit. They pressed the Caesar to hasten the departure of the troops, but they imprudently rejected the honest and judicious advice of Julian, who proposed that they should not march through Paris, and suggested the danger and temptation of a last interview. As soon as the approach of the troops was announced, the Caesar went out to meet them and ascended his tribunal, which had been erected in a plain before the gates of the city. After distinguishing the officers and soldiers who by their rank or merit deserved a peculiar attention, Julian addressed himself in a studied oration to the surrounding multitude. He celebrated their exploits with grateful applause, encouraged them to accept, with alacrity, the honor of serving under the eyes of a powerful and liberal monarch, and admonished them that the commands of Augustus required an instant and cheerful obedience. The soldiers, who were apprehensive of offending their general by an indecent clamor, or of belying their sentiments by a false and venal acclamations, maintained an obstinate silence and after a short pause were dismissed to their quarters. The principal officers were entertained by the Caesar, who professed, in the warmest language of friendship, his desire and his inability to reward, according to their deserts, the brave companions of his victories. They retired from the feast full of grief and perplexity, and lamented the hardship of their fate, which tore them from their beloved general and their native country. The only expedient which could prevent their separation was boldly agitated and approved, the popular resentment was insensibly molded into a regular conspiracy. Their just reasons of complaint were heightened by passion, and their passions were inflamed by wine, as on the eve of their departure the troops were indulged in licentious festivity. At the hour of midnight the impetuous multitude, with swords and bows and torches in their hands, rushed into the suburbs, encompassed the palace, and, careless of future dangers, proclaimed the fatal and irrevocable words, Julian Augustus. The prince, whose anxious suspense was interrupted by the disorderly acclamations, secured the doors against their intrusion, and as long as it was in his power, secluded his person and dignity from the accidents of a nocturnal tumult. At the dawn of day, the soldiers, whose zeal was irritated by opposition, forcibly entered the palace, seized, with respectful violence, the object of their choice, guarded Julian with drawn swords through the streets of Paris, placed him on a tribunal, and with repeated shouts saluted him as their emperor. Prudence, as well as loyalty, inculcated the propriety of resisting their treasonable designs, and of preparing for his oppressed virtue the excuse of violence. Addressing himself by turns to the multitude and to individuals, he sometimes implored their mercy, and sometimes expressed his indignation, conjured them not to sully the fame of their immortal victories, and ventured to promise that, if they would immediately return to their allegiance, he would undertake to obtain from the emperor not only a free and gracious pardon, but even the revocation of the orders which had excited their resentment. But the soldiers, who were conscious of their guilt, chose rather to depend on the gratitude of Julian than on the clemency of the emperor. Their zeal was insensibly turned into impatience, and their impatience into rage. The inflexible Caesar sustained, till the third hour of the day, their prayers, their reproaches, and their menaces, 
nor did he yield till he had been repeatedly assured that, if he wished to live, he must consent to reign. He was exalted on a shield in the presence and amidst the unanimous acclamations of the troops. A rich military collar, which was offered by chance, supplied the want of a diadem. The ceremony was concluded by the promise of a moderate donative, and the new emperor, overwhelmed with real or affected grief, retired into the most secret recesses of his apartment. The grief of Julian could proceed only from his innocence, but his innocence must appear extremely doubtful in the eyes of those who have learned to suspect the motives and professions of princes. His lively and active mind was susceptible of the various impressions of hope and fear, of gratitude and of revenge, of duty and of ambition, of the love of fame and of the fear of reproach. But it is impossible for us to calculate the respective weight and operation of these sentiments, or to ascertain the principles of action which might escape the observation, while they guided, or rather impelled, the steps of Julian himself. The discontent of the troops was produced by the malice of his enemies. Their tumult was the natural effect of interest and of passion, and if Julian had tried to conceal a deep design under the appearances of chance, he must have employed the most consummate artifice, without necessity, and probably without success. He solemnly declares, in the presence of Jupiter, of the Sun, of Mars, of Minerva, and of all the other deities, that till the close of the evening which preceded his elevation, he was utterly ignorant of the designs of the soldiers. And it may seem ungenerous to distrust the honor of a hero and the truth of a philosopher. Yet the superstitious confidence that Constantius was the enemy, and that he himself was the favorite of the gods, might prompt him to desire, to solicit, and even to hasten the auspicious moment of his reign, which was predestined to restore the ancient religion of mankind. When Julian had received the intelligence of the conspiracy, he resigned himself to a short slumber, and afterwards related to his friends that he had seen the genius of the empire, waiting with some impatience at his door, pressing for admittance, and reproaching his want of spirit and ambition. Astonished and perplexed, he addressed his prayers to the great Jupiter, who immediately signified, by a clear and manifest omen, that he should submit to the will of heaven and of the army. The conduct which disclaims the ordinary maxims of reason excites our suspicion and eludes our inquiry. Whenever the spirit of fanaticism, at once so credulous and so crafty, has insinuated itself into a noble mind, it insensibly corrodes the vital principles of virtue and veracity. To moderate the zeal of his party, to protect the persons of his enemies, to defeat and to despise the secret enterprises which were formed against his life and dignity, were the cares which employed the first days of the reign of the new emperor. Although he was firmly resolved to maintain the station which he had assumed, he was still desirous of saving his country from the calamities of civil war, of declining a contest with the superior forces of Constantius, and of preserving his own character from the reproach of perfidy and ingratitude. Adorned with the ensigns of military and imperial pomp, Julian showed himself in the field of Mars to the soldiers, who glowed with ardent enthusiasm, in the cause of their pupil, their leader, and their friend. He recapitulated their victories, lamented their sufferings, applauded their resolution, animated their hopes, and checked their impetuosity. Nor did he dismiss the assembly till he had obtained a solemn promise from his troops that, if the Emperor of the East would subscribe an equitable treaty, they would renounce any views of conquest and satisfy themselves with the tranquil possession of the Gallic provinces. On this foundation he composed, in his own name and in that of the army, a specious and moderate epistle, which was delivered to Pentadius, his master of the offices, and to his chamberlain, Eutherius, two ambassadors who he appointed to receive the answer and observe the dispositions of Constantius. This epistle is inscribed with the moderate appellation of Caesar, but Julian solicits in a peremptory, though respectful manner, the confirmation of the title of Augustus. He acknowledges the irregularity of his own election, while he justifies, in some measure, the resentment and violence of the troops, which had extorted his reluctant consent. He allows the supremacy of his brother Constantius, and engages to send him an annual present of Spanish horses, to recruit his army with a select number of barbarian youths, and to accept from his choice a praetorian prefect of approved discretion and of fidelity. But he reserves for himself the nomination of his other civil and military officers, with the troops, the revenue, and the sovereignty of the provinces beyond the Alps. He admonishes the emperor to consult the dictates of justice, to distrust the arts, 
of those venal flatterers who subsist only by the discord of princes, and to embrace the offer of a fair and honorable treaty, equally advantageous to the Republic and to the House of Constantine. In this negotiation, Julian claimed no more than he already possessed, the delegated authority which he had long exercised over the provinces of Gaul, Spain, and Britain, was still obeyed under a name more independent and august. The soldiers and the people rejoiced in the revolution, which was not stained even with the blood of the guilty. Florentius was a fugitive, Lupinicus a prisoner. The persons who were disaffected to the new government were disarmed and secured, and the vacant officers were distributed, according to the recommendation of merit, by a prince who despised the intrigues of the palace and the clamors of the soldiers. The negotiations of peace were accompanied and supported by the most vigorous preparations for war. The army, which Julian held in readiness for immediate action, was recruited and augmented by the disorders of the times. The cruel persecution of the faction of Mingentius had filled Gaul with numerous out bands of outlaws and robbers. They cheerfully accepted the offer of a general pardon from a prince whom they could trust and submitted to the restraints of military discipline, and retained only their implacable hatred to the person and government of Constantius. As soon as the season of the year permitted Julian to take the field, he appeared at the head of his legions, threw a bridge over the Rhine in the neighborhood of Cleve, and prepared to chastise the perfidy of the Atuarii, a band of Franks, who presumed that they might ravage with impunity the frontiers of a divided empire. The difficulty, as well as glory, of this enterprise consisted in a laborious march, and Julian had conquered, as soon as he could penetrate into a country which former princes had considered as inaccessible. After he had given peace to the barbarians, the emperor carefully visited the fortifications along the Rhine, from Cleve to Basel, surveyed with peculiar attention the territories which he had recovered from the hands of the Alemanni, passed through Besançon, which had severely suffered from their fury, and fixed his headquarters at Vienne for the ensuing winter. The barrier of Gaul was improved and strengthened with additional fortifications, and Julian entertained some hopes that the Germans, whom he had so often vanquished, might in his absence be restrained by the terror of his name. Vadomer was the only prince of the Alemanni whom he esteemed or feared, and while the subtle barbarian affected to observe the faith of trees, the progress of his arms threatened the state with an unseasonable and dangerous war. The policy of Julian condescended to surprise the prince of the Alemanni by his own arts, and Vadomer, who, in the character of a friend, had incautiously accepted an invitation from the Roman governors, was seized in the midst of the entertainment, and sent away prisoner into the heart of Spain. Before the barbarians had recovered from their amazement, the emperor appeared in arms on the banks of the Rhine, and once more crossing the river, renewed the deep impressions of terror and respect which had already been made by four preceding expeditions. End of chapter 22, part 1Chapter 22, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The ambassadors of Julian had been instructed to execute with the utmost diligence their important commission, but in their passage through Italy and Illyricum they were detained by the tedious and affected delays of the provincial governors. They were conducted by slow journeys from Constantinople to Caesarea and Cappadocia, and when at length they were admitted to the presence of Constantius, they found that he had already conceived, from the dispatches of his own officers, the most unfavorable opinion of the conduct of Julian and of the Gallic army. The letters were heard with impatience, the trembling messengers were dismissed with indignation and contempt, and the looks, the gestures, the furious language of the monarch expressed the disorder of his soul. The domestic connection, which might have reconciled the brother and the husband of Helena, was recently dissolved by the death of that princess, whose pregnancy had been several times fruitless, and was at last fatal to herself. The Empress Eusebia had preserved, to the last moment of her life, the warm and even jealous affection which she had conceived for Julian, and her mild influence might have moderated the resentment of a prince, who, since her death, was abandoned to his own passions, and to the arts of his eunuchs. But the terror of a foreign invasion obliged him to suspend the punishment of a private enemy. He continued his march towards the confines of Persia, 
and thought it sufficient to signify the conditions which might entitle Julian and his guilty followers to the clemency of their offended sovereign. He required that the presumptuous Caesar should expressly renounce the appellation and rank of Augustus, which he had accepted from the rebels, that he should descend to his former station of a limited and dependent minister, that he should vest the powers of the state and army in the hands of those officers who were appointed by the imperial court, and that he should trust his safety to the assurances of pardon, which were announced by Epictetus, a Gallic bishop, and one of the Arian favorites of Constantius. Several months were ineffectually consumed in a treaty which was negotiated at the distance of three thousand miles between Paris and Antioch, and as soon as Julian perceived that his moderate and respectful behavior served only to irritate the pride of an implacable adversary, he boldly resolved to commit his life and fortune to the chance of a civil war. He gave a public and military audience to the quaestor Leonis. The haughty epistle of Constantius was read to the attentive multitude, and Julian protested, with the most flattering deference, that he was ready to resign the title of Augustus, if he could obtain the consent of those whom he acknowledged as the authors of his elevation. The faint proposal was impetuously silenced, and the acclamations of Julian Augustus continued to reign by the authority of the army, of the people, of the republic which you have saved, thundered at once from every part of the field, and terrified the pale ambassadors of Constantius. A part of the letter was afterwards read, in which the emperor arraigned the ingratitude of Julian, whom he had invested with the honors of the purple, whom he had educated with so much care and tenderness, whom he had preserved in his infancy when he was left a helpless orphan. An orphan, interrupted Julian, who justified his cause by indulging his passions. Does the assassin of my family reproach me that I was left an orphan? He urges me to revenge those injuries which I have long studied to forget. The assembly was dismissed, and Leonis, who with some difficulty had been protected from the popular fury, was sent back to his master with an epistle in which Julian expressed, in a strain of the most vehement eloquence, the sentiments of contempt, of hatred, and of resentment, which had been suppressed and embittered by the dissimulation of twenty years. After this message, which might be considered as a signal of irreconcilable war, Julian, who some weeks before had celebrated the Christian festival at the Epiphany, made a public declaration that he committed the care of his safety to the immortal gods, and thus publicly renounced the religion as well as the friendship of Constantius. The situation of Julian required a vigorous and immediate resolution. He had discovered from intercepted letters that his adversary, sacrificing the interest of the state to that of the monarch, had again excited the barbarians to invade the provinces of the west. The position of two magazines one of them collected on the banks of the Lake of Constance, the other formed at the foot of the Cotian Alps, seemed to indicate the march of two armies, and the size of those magazines, each of which consisted of 600,000 quarters of wheat, or rather, flour, was a threatening evidence of the strength and numbers of the enemy who prepared to surround him. But the imperial legions were still in their distant quarters of Asia. The Danube was feebly guarded, and if Julian could occupy, by a sudden incursion, the important provinces of Illyricum, he might expect that a people of soldiers would resort to his standard, and that the rich mines of gold and silver would contribute to the expenses of the civil war. He proposed this bold enterprise to the assembly of the soldiers, inspired them with a just confidence in their general, and in themselves, and exhorted them to maintain their reputation of being terrible to the enemy, moderate to their fellow citizens, and obedient to their officers. His spirited discourse was received with the loudest acclamations, and the same troops which had taken up arms against Constantius when he summoned them to leave Gaul, now declared with alacrity that they would follow Julian to the farthest extremities of Europe or Asia. The oath of fidelity was administered, and the soldiers, clashing their shields and pointing their drawn swords to their throats, devoted themselves with horrid imprecations to the service of a leader whom they celebrated as the deliverer of Gaul and the conqueror of the Germans. This solemn engagement, which seemed to be dictated by affection rather than by duty, was singly opposed by Nebriticus, who had been admitted to the office of Praetorian Prefect. That faithful minister, alone and unassisted, asserted the rights of Constantius in the midst of an armed and angry multitude, to whose fury he had, he had almost fallen an honorable but useless sacrifice. After losing one of his hands by the stroke of a sword, he embraced the knees of the prince whom he had offended. Julian covered the prefect with his imperial mantle, 
and protecting him from the zeal of his followers, dismissed him to his own house, with less respect than was perhaps due to the virtue of an enemy. The high office in Nebriticus was bestowed on Sallust, and the provinces of Gaul, which were now delivered from the intolerable oppression of taxes, enjoyed the mild and equitable administration of a friend of Julian, who was permitted to practice those virtues which he had instilled in the mind of his pupil. The hopes of Julian depended much less on the number of his troops than on the celerity of his motions. In the execution of a daring enterprise, he availed himself of every precaution, as far as prudence could suggest, and where prudence could no longer accompany his steps, he trusted the event to valor and to fortune. In the neighborhood of Basil, he assembled and divided his army. One body, which consisted of ten thousand men, was directed, under the command of Nevetta, general of the cavalry, to advance through the midland parts of Raetia and Noricum. A similar division of troops, under the orders of Jovius and Jovinus, prepared to follow the oblique course of the highways through the Alps in the northern confines of Italy. The instructions to the generals was conceived with energy and precision, to hasten their march in close and compact columns, which, according to the disposition of the ground, might readily be changed into any order of battle, to secure themselves against the surprises of the night by strong posts and vigilant guards, to prevent resistance by their unexpected arrival, and to elude examination by their sudden departure, to spread the opinion of their strength and the terror of his name, and to join their sovereign under the walls of Sirmium. For himself, Julian had preserved a more difficult and extraordinary part. He selected three thousand brave and active volunteers, resolved, like their leader, to cast behind them every hope of retreat. At the head of this faithful band, he fearlessly plunged into the recesses of the Marcian, or Black Forest, which conceals the sources of the Danube, and for many days the fate of Julian was unknown to the world. The secrecy of his march, his diligence and vigor, surmounted every obstacle. He forced his way over mountains and morasses, occupied the bridges or swam the rivers, pursued his direct course without reflecting whether he traversed the territory of the Romans or of the barbarians, and at length emerged between Redisban and Vienna, at the place where he had designed to embark his troops on the Danube. By a well-concerted stratagem he seized a fleet of light brigantines as it lay at anchor, secured a supply of coarse provisions sufficient to satisfy the indelicate but voracious appetite of a Gallic army, and boldly committed himself to the stream of the Danube. The labors of his mariners, who plied their oars with incessant diligence, and the steady continuance of a favorable wind, carried his fleet above seven hundred miles in eleven days, and he had already disembarked his troops at Bononia, only nineteen miles from Sirmium, before his enemies could receive any certain intelligence that he had left the banks of the Rhine. In the course of this long and rapid navigation, the mind of Julian was fixed on the object of his enterprise, and though he accepted the deputations of some cities, which hastened to claim the merit of an early submission, he passed before the hostile stations, which were placed along the river, without indulging the temptation of signalizing a useless and ill-timed valor. The banks of the Danube were crowded on either side with spectators, who gazed on with the military pomp, anticipated the importance of the event, and diffused through the adjacent country the fame of the young hero, who advanced with more than mortal speed at the head of innumerable forces of the West. Lucilian, who, with the rank of general of the cavalry, commanded the military powers of Illyricum, was alarmed and perplexed by the doubtful reports, which he could neither reject nor believe. He had taken some slow and no resolute measures for the purpose of collecting his troops, when he was surprised by Dagalephus, an active officer, whom Julian, as soon as he landed at Bononia, had pushed forwards with some light infantry. The captive general, uncertain of his life or death, was hastily thrown upon a horse, and conducted to the presence of Julian, who kindly raised him from the ground, and dispelled the terror and amazement which seemed to stupefy his faculties. But Lucilian had no sooner recovered his spirits than he betrayed his want of discretion, by presuming to admonish his conqueror that he had rashly ventured, with a handful of men, to expose his person in the midst of his enemies. Reserve for your master Constantius these timid remonstrances, replied Julian, with a smile of contempt. When I gave you my purple to kiss, I received you not as a counselor, but as a suppliant. Conscious that success alone could justify his attempts, and that boldness only could command success, he instantly advanced, at the head of three thousand soldiers, to attack the strongest and most populous city of the Illyrian provinces. As he entered the long suburb of Sirmium, he was received by the joyful acclamations of the army and the people, 
who crowned with flowers, and holding lighted tapers in their hands, conducted their acknowledged sovereign to his imperial residence. Two days were devoted to the public joy, which was celebrated by the games of the circus. But early on the morning of the third day, Julian marched to occupy the narrow pass of Suchi in the defiles of Mount Hymus, which, almost in the midway between Sirmium and Constantinople, separates the provinces of Thrace and Dacia by an abrupt descent towards the former and a general declivity on the side of the latter. The defense of this important post was entrusted to the brave Nevita, who, as well as the generals of the Italian division, successfully executed the plan of the march and the junction which their master had so ably conceived. The homage which Julian obtained from the fears or the inclinations of the people extended far beyond the immediate effects of his arms. The prefectures of Italy and Illyricum were administered by Taurus and Florentius, who united that important office with the vain honors of the consulship. And as those magistrates had retired with precipitation to the court of Asia, Julian, who could not always restrain the levity of his temper, stigmatized their flight by adding, in all the acts of the year, the epitaph of fugitive to the names of the two consuls. The provinces which had been deserted by their first magistrates acknowledged the authority of an emperor who, conciliating the qualities of a soldier with those of a philosopher, was equally admired in the camps of the Danube and in the cities of Greece. From his palace, or more properly from his headquarters of Sirmium and Nisus, he distributed to the principal cities of the empire a labored apology for his own conduct, published the secret dispatches of Constantius, and solicited the judgment of mankind between two competitors, one of whom had expelled and the other had invited the barbarians. Julian, whose mind was deeply wounded by the reproach of ingratitude, aspired to maintain, by argument as well as by arms, the superior merits of his cause, and to excel not only in the arts of war, but in those of composition. His epistle to the Senate and people of Athens seems to have been dictated by an elegant enthusiasm, which prompted him to submit his actions and motives to the degenerate Athenians of his own times, with the same humble deference as if he had been pleading in the days of Aristides before the tribunal of the Areopagus. His application to the Senate of Rome, which was still permitted to bestow the titles of imperial power, was agreeable to the forms of the expiring republic. An assembly was summoned by Tertullius, prefect of the city. The epistle of Julian was read, and as he appeared to be the master of Italy, his claims were admitted without a dissenting voice. His oblique censure of the innovations of Constantine, and his passionate invective against the vices of Constantius, were heard with less satisfaction, and the Senate, as if Julian had been present, unanimously exclaimed, Respect, we beseech you, the author of your own fortune an artful expression, which, according to the chance of war, might be differently explained as a manly reproof of the ingratitude of the usurper, or as a flattering confession that a single act of such benefit to the state ought to atone for all the failings of Constantius. The intelligence of the march and rapid progress of Julian was speedily transmitted to his rival, who, by the retreat of Sapor, had obtained some respite from the Persian war. Disguising the anguish of his soul under the semblance of contempt, Constantius professed his intention of returning into Europe and of giving chase to Julian, for he never spoke of this military expedition in any other light than that of a hunting party. In the camp of Heriopolis in Syria, he communicated this design to his army, slightly mentioned the guilt and rashness of the Caesar, and ventured to assure them that, if the mutineers of Gaul presumed to meet them in the field, they would be unable to sustain the fire of their eyes and the irresistible weight of the shout of their onset. The speech of the emperor was received with military applause, and Theodotus, the president of the council of Heriopolis, requested with tears of adulation that his city might be adorned with the head of the vanquished rebel. The chosen detachment was dispatched away in post wagons to secure, if it were yet possible, the pass of Suchi. The recruits, the horses, the arms, and the magazines, which had been prepared against Sapor, were appropriated to the service of the civil war and the domestic victories of Constantius inspired his partisans with the most sanguine assurances of success. The notary Gaudentius had occupied in his name the provinces of Africa. The substance of Rome was intercepted, and the distress of Julian was increased by an unexpected event, which might have been productive of fatal consequences. Julian had received the submission of two legions and a cohort of archers which were stationed at Sirmium, but he suspected, with reason, the fidelity of those troops which had been distinguished by the emperor, and it was thought expedient, under the pretense of the exposed state of the Gallic frontier, 
to dismiss them from the most important scene of action. They advanced with reluctance as far as the confines of Italy, but as they dreaded the length of the way and of the savage fierceness of the Germans, they resolved, by the instigation of one of their tribunes, to halt at Aquileia, to erect the banners of Constantius on the walls of that impregnable city. The vigilance of Julian perceived at once the extent of the mischief and the necessity of applying an immediate remedy. By his order, Jovinus led back a part of the army into Italy, and the siege of Aquileia was formed with diligence and prosecuted with vigor. But the legionaries, who seemed to have rejected the yoke of discipline, conducted the defense of the place with skill and perseverance, invited the rest of Italy to imitate the example of their courage and loyalty, and threatened the retreat of Julian if he should be forced to yield to the superior numbers of the armies of the East. But the humanity of Julian was preserved from the cruel alternative which he pathetically laments of destroying or of being himself destroyed, and the seasonal death of Constantius delivered the Roman Empire from the calamities of civil war. The approach of winter could not detain the monarch at Antioch, and his favorites durst not oppose his impatient desire of revenge. A slight fever, which was perhaps occasioned by the agitation of his spirits, was increased by the fatigues of the journey, and Constantius was obliged to halt at the little town of Maxurene, twelve miles beyond Tarsus, where he expired after a short illness in the forty-fifth year of his age and the twenty-fourth of his reign. His genuine character, which was composed of pride and weakness, of superstition and cruelty, has been fully displayed in the preceding narrative of civil and ecclesiastical events. The long abuse of power rendered him a considerable object in the eyes of his contemporaries. But, as personal merit can alone deserve the notice of posterity, the last of the sons of Constantine may be dismissed from the world with the remark that he had inherited the defects without the abilities of his father. Before Constantius expired, he is said to have named Julian for his successor, nor does it seem improbable that his anxious concern for the fate of a young and tender wife whom he left with child may have prevailed in his last moments over the harsher passions of hatred and revenge. Eusebius and his guilty associates made a faint attempt to prolong the reign of the eunuchs by the election of another emperor, but their intrigues were rejected with disdain by an army which now abhorred the thought of a civil war, and two officers of rank were instantly dispatched to assure Julian that every sword in the empire would be drawn for his service. The military designs of that prince who had formed three different attacks against Thrace, were prevented by this fortunate event. Without shedding the blood of his fellow citizens, he escaped the dangers of a doubtful conflict, and acquired the advantages of a complete victory. Impatient to visit the place of his birth, and the new capital of the empire, he advanced from Nisus through the mountains of Hymus and the cities of Thrace. When he reached Heraclea, at the distance of sixty miles, all Constantinople was poured forth to receive him, and he made his triumphal entry amidst the dutiful acclamations of the soldiers, the people, and the senate. An innumerable multitude pressed around him with eager respect, and were perhaps disappointed when they beheld the small stature and simple garb of a hero, whose inexperienced youth had vanquished the barbarians of Germany, and who had now traversed in a successful career the whole continent of Europe, from the shores of the Atlantic to those of the Bosphorus. A few days afterwards, when the remains of the deceased emperor were landed in the harbor, the subjects of Julian applauded the real or affected humanity of their sovereign. On foot, without his diadem, and clothed in a mourning habit, he accompanied the funeral as far as the Church of the Holy Apostles, where the body was deposited, and if these remarks of respect may be interpreted as a selfish tribute to the birth and dignity of his imperial kinsmen, the tears of Julian professed to the world that he had forgotten the injuries and remembered only the obligations which he had received from Constantius. As soon as the legions of Aquileia were assured of the death of the emperor, they opened the gates of the city, and, by the sacrifice of their guilty leaders, obtained an easy pardon from the prudence or lenity of Julian, who, in the thirty-second year of his age, acquired the undisputed possession of the Roman Empire. End of chapter 22, part 2